Good morning, and uh, or after it's now afternoon, and it's great to see so many people here today uh, to welcome back to Yale, Dr. P. Oh, just watch out! There's a thing of hot soup right next to you, so I don't want the welcome to be that warm. <laughs> Come on, this is good. I mean, you know. Okay, so Jimmy Fallon has no worries. Okay, um, it is a great delight to welcome Peter Marks back to Yale. There are seats up front, guys, really nice seats, warm. They've got rests you can put your food on, and, and uh, Dr. Hoxter's anthrax is totally treated, so it's okay. Um, but uh, it's wonderful to invite Peter back uh, to Yale. I've known Peter um, for the past 20 years, and the things that people know about Peter were obvious when he was here at Yale. They were obvious when he was at the Brigham Women's Hospital and the Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School and the Dana-Farber. Peter is, quite simply, one of the very best doctors that I have ever worked with in any uh, context. Um, he is an extraordinary hematologist, um, and he also is probably one of the most selfless and generous teachers and mentors that you'll ever work with in any environment. And this room would not be filled to the degree that it is, Peter, if that was not true. And the people that you um, that you touched and influenced while you were here. Um, and it's true, again, it's not just here, but it's also um, at, uh, at, at, uh, at Harvard before this. Um, routinely getting the very best reviews from our students, uh, from our uh, house staff, from the nursing staff, uh, a passion advocate of patient uh, quality care, and just a spectacular hematologist in a time when hematology uh, has become something which, is, which has been more and more challenging to find people who are true, spectacular hematologists uh, all around. So we were delighted to have Peter here. And I've always made the point that we were loaning Peter to the government, that it's a perfectly acceptable model okay, for Yale professors to go and spend time as Secretary of State or at the FDA or working in the military and that we would welcome Peter back to the faculty with open arms. In fact, we've got a couple of attending slots that are already open for September, okay, um, when the administration, you know, might come up with different ideas. But we're delighted to have Peter here today. Uh, he's really wonderful and he's going to be talking to us today about from bench top to shelf top advancing novel ca cancer therapies. Dr. Marks. Um, th thank, you, thank you very much. For, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and also uh, thank you for inviting me today. Thank you also to Dr. Snyder for, for thinking of me for uh, giving this talk. Um, let's make sure I can make this happen. So what, what I, I, I could do for the next 45 minutes or so is just talk about regulations and how they might help uh, advance cancer therapies. And if I gave my regular regulatory talk, um, probably about half of you would be asleep. The other half would be near enough to sleep that I could sneak out, get a cup of coffee, and come back, and you wouldn't know that I was gone. Um, but instead, what I'd like to try to do is give you uh, a bit of uh, an overview of the regulatory framework uh, that FDA uses uh, to both ensure the safety and the efficacy of uh, products that are approved, and then take you through a hypothetical example uh, of a novel product uh, that could go from kind of concept uh, and discovery to, uh, to actually a real product on a shelf. So in case you do fall asleep, it's okay. I, I think I have to be honest, I've probably slept through uh, more grand rounds than I care to admit to. Um, the, 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 Im the important thing here is that FDA has a balanced mission now, which is both to protect public health, obviously to keep unsafe things from reaching the market, but also to promote it through helping facilitate the development of novel products. And um, you'll see how that kind of has evolved over time from, uh, from the kind of protective mission to the promoting uh, mission. So what, what drives regulation? Usually bad things drive regulation. Um, why would you need regulation? Why can't it just be uh, you know, good products, free market economy? Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't that the best product win out? Well, if you look at what drove it in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, it was the fact that bad things happened. 
Uh, at the beginning of uh, the 20th century, uh, 13 children in St. Louis, Missouri got uh, a, a, what was being used at that time, uh, a diphtheria antitoxin uh, that uh, came from a horse that had had tetanus and died of tetanus. Actually, it was put down, the horse named Jim, unfortunately, had to be put down. And unfortunately, the stuff was bottled up. His serum was accidentally bottled up, put on the shelf, and used, killed 13 children. And, and shortly after that, there was another accident similar to that uh, in Camden, New Jersey. The response of Congress was to pass the Biologics Control Act of 1902, which actually gave uh, the precursor, uh, a precursor to FDA. Actually, at the time, it was actually a precursor to NIH, uh, the Public Health Service and Marine Hospital Hygienic Lab, which was actually subsequently became the NIH, the ability to inspect facilities uh, that were uh, making uh, biologic products. So that, that's kind of what Congress does, is something bad happens and there is a reaction, and this reaction was to allow uh, inspection of, of manufacturing facilities. Well, fast forward about a little more than a century, what happens? 751 people have confirmed or probable cases of fungal meningitis in 20 states, 64 people die. Uh, in nine states, uh, and this is associated with uh, a contaminated steroid uh, used for parenteral use uh, for epidural steroid injections and other injections that came from a compounding pharmacy in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Not a good thing. What happens? Congress reacts. In this case, Congress being not perhaps they're trying to get stuff done. In, in 2013, uh, has the Drug Quality and Security Act. <coughs> Uh, which uh, has a class of outsourcing compounding pharmacies. Compounding pharmacies have become very important, actually, to hospitals because they, they manufacture a number of things at a greatly reduced cost. Unfortunately, sometimes bad things happen when there's no oversight or when there's low oversight uh, uh, from state authorities, and this is what happened. So, again, a, uh, a, an action-reaction. Um, and if you look at FDA's history, the early part of FDA's history was all of about reacting to bad things happening, um, be it the Biologics Control Act, the Food and Drugs Act, if you want to read some interesting thing, Upton Sinclair, things that were going on with foods back then, but also drugs, snake oil, literally, um, uh, was back then. Now there's a component of that that pertains even to today, because there is 21st century snake oil, it comes in the form of stem cells and claims around them. So we still have to watch out for that. But over the course of uh, the evolution of this, things went from just making sure that things were safe to making sure they were also effective. That came with the Kefauer-Harris amendments uh, in 1962. So FDA before that only looked at safety of products and the fact that the labeling had to be somewhat representative, and after that time, it also had to evaluate products for efficacy. And then what's more is that in 1992, uh, a novel program uh, was set up by Congress in which FDA now gets user fees, charges manufacturers a reasonable sum of money in return for making sure that drug development is facilitated. And I'm going to tell you about some of those programs. And since 1992, with each five-year renewal of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act or similar acts, there's been kind of more put on the Christmas tree, so there are more and more things that are done to help facilitate uh, drug development. So what are the principal uh, therapeutic categories we deal with, the medical therapies? I'm not going to talk at all about foods. I'm not going to talk at all about veterinary medicine today. Um, uh, but I will talk about uh, things that are relevant to drugs and biologics, and to a slight extent, uh, to devices. Each, there are several different centers at, at FDA that deal with these. Center for Drugs obviously deals with drugs and certain biologics. Um, the Center for Biologics Evaluation Research does research in the area of biologics and, uh, and deals with complex biologics like cell-based therapies and others I'll tell you about. And there's the Center for Devices, which has become increasingly uh, uh, busy with various devices, uh, both for therapies and for diagnostics. And then you can have things that are drugs, biologics, and devices, and so there's a special office that deals with those because they actually have uh, a particular level of complexity. So 
where do we uh, where do we get our regulatory authority from? Well, um, some of it comes from a place, uh, the National Archives on Constitution Avenue. Um, although it sounds kind of crazy, since I've been at FDA, several times uh, the judiciary branch has uh, has given us authority or has referenced authority that come directly from the Constitution, basically from Commerce Clause, because we deal with things that are introduced into interstate commerce. Sometimes it has to do with First Amendment things. What can a manufacturer say about their product? Um, uh, so ultimately, obviously, that may seem, I don't know, it's, it's always fascinating to me that this kind of dusky document that you look at um, still it has a lot of life. It does. Um, but the way that's put into practice is laws passed by Congress um, and signed by the President. The problem with laws is that what they, what they do for you is they say, well, a biologic product needs to be pure. What does that really mean? And pure means maybe it's free of this or that, but you have to define what that is. And because of that, FDA comes into play and puts into place rules which define what pure is. Pure means free of bacterial contamination. It means free of substances that could cause toxic effects. So I'll talk for in a minute more about what rulemaking is. And then even if we say that it needs to be free of bacterial contamination, that doesn't say how you show it's free of bacterial contamination. And so FDA then has another level um, of information called guidance. Guidance isn't something that we enforce in terms of inspections, but it's our interpretation of how you as a, a manufacturer or as an individual in a, uh, an academic laboratory would comply with our rules. So rulemaking is actually democracy in action because rulemaking, so Congress passes a law and we have to uh, enforce that law, so we will put a notice of public rulemaking. Uh, and that comes out every year. We have a regulatory agenda. We publish the proposed rule and then you can get on to the federal, uh, you look in the federal register, you get onto the federal docket and you can put comments in and submit them. And believe me, I've read a lot of them. Some of them, you can imagine, it's like, it's like asking a bunch of Yale students whether they like your lecture or not. Some liked it, some don't like it, and some put nasty comments. Um, and we read through them all. We address them all, even some of the nasty ones. Um, and then we address those, uh, and then uh, you have a final rule that's published, uh, taking into those into consideration. Sometimes you'll, you'll see, if you read this, that sometimes it can be quite, quite controversial. Um, Guidance is a little less controversial because it doesn't have quite the same force uh, as rules do. Rules are something that FDA inspects to. It's something that if you don't follow a rule, we can say, hey, there's a problem here. Uh, guidance is something that says, okay, well, if you want to show that, uh, that something is sterile, you can use X test. And it, it basically says how you can comply with, uh, with regulations. And it doesn't mean you have to use that method. If you can show you're doing the job some other way, um, we will accept it. So we have these various ways of, of, of dealing with things. These are things that help us make sure that products are safe. But what about promoting product development? So that's an increasingly part of, an important part of what we do at, at FDA um, because we want to facilitate the development of innovative medical therapies, uh, things that, uh, that uh, meet unmet medical needs. That doesn't mean that we're not open to things that are, uh, that, that are for other purposes. We do obviously approve uh, drugs that would be considered lifestyle drugs. Um, but you know, I, I think what the intent of Congress is that a very important part of our mission is to make sure that, uh, that things like cancer therapies get to market in as fast a manner uh, in which they can. And toward that end, as I mentioned, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, PDUFA, which, by the way, when I was in industry, for, for years in industry, I didn't know what PDUFA stand for because everyone mentions it, but that's what it is. It's uh, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. Uh, uh, and uh, this has really uh, been put in place with some programs that I'm about to tell you about, which really help manufacturers facilitate uh, development. So these are called expedited development programs. And I'm going to show you how these apply in an example in a couple of minutes, but just bear with me for a couple more minutes while I take you through um, what these various things do. So one of the older programs, Fast Track, Priority Review, Accelerated Approval, and then Breakthrough Therapy, which is essentially an amalgam of all of these, these are really things that are mainly applicable to treating serious conditions like cancer. Now we argue about what serious means. And you can imagine, 
there are certain drugs which I, 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 that, that people might consider for serious things. Hangnail could be serious to some. Um, but uh, we, try to, we, try to, we try to apply these to, to serious conditions, although it is true that there's some discussion over what serious uh, is. So fast track is, is, is meant for serious conditions like cancer therapies. And to qualify, basically, something has to show that it will meet an unmet medical need. Um, and there, is, there are some special exceptions you'll see up on the slides, just to be technically correct, because in the infectious disease right now, world right now, there are some problems with multidrug resistance. So a lot of things have been kind of tailored to help those things along. So either you're meeting uh, an unmet medical need, or you have these qualified infectious disease products which show promise for, for, for essentially infectious diseases with unmet medical need. So the fast track basically allows the agency to have more interaction with sponsors. It's not a huge thing, but it also allows sponsors to start submitting regulatory submissions on a rolling basis. You can say, why does this matter? Come on, it's the electronic age. Well, in the past, when these things were sent by truck to FDA, the regulatory submission would routinely take a 23-foot truck to drive up to FDA and unload. So we're talking about things that usually have 100,000 pages or more. So the idea of being able to submit that in, in, in smaller boluses is useful to manufacturers. It's also useful for the review process, because the sooner <coughs> in, the sooner out. Um, what goes along is somewhat a corollary to uh, fast track is priority review. Priority review again for serious, um, for serious, uh, pro for products that are ad addressing serious conditions, allows FDA to say, look, this is a serious condition. This product will represent a serious improvement over something. And recently, there are a number of uh, oncology products which are near and dear to people's hearts here. Um, uh, which received priority review. FDA reviewed them in six months or less um, rather than the standard 10-month time frame. So it's basically, it makes people work more um, to get those done. Um, and again, as part of that, that whole process, you could imagine that there would be a very promising cancer therapy where you might not have the most mature survival data, but you might have a very good surrogate endpoint um, either clinical response or progression-free survival, um, things that you might trust to predict uh, that this thing would have efficacy. And the accelerated approval uh, basically allows us at, at FDA to approve something on a surrogate endpoint with kind of a, an IOU from the manufacturer that they'll, prevent, they'll provide us with data that actually says, hey, this thing really does meet uh, a, a clinically validated endpoint like overall survival. And I'll tell you, increasingly we try to, we try to find things that we can approve things on the first go round without using accelerated approval because every accelerated approval means we have to do bookkeeping uh, to keep track of these, uh, these uh, commitments that are made um, uh, to provide additional data. Um, but this does allow us to get there faster, particularly in the rapidly uh, evolving uh, area of cancer therapies. Breakthrough designation was something that came into being at the last uh, go-round with Congress in 2012, when Congress wanted, uh, they, they said, give us, we, we, need something, we need something big to put in here to balance the, the continued use of user fees. And breakthrough therapy is basically an amalgam of the programs I just told you about. It's not really a novel pathway. But what breakthrough therapy designation gives to a product is everything I've just told you about, plus it gives more senior uh, attention to a product within the agency. Basically, uh, the review gets the attention of, of senior leadership, and it also has more interaction. So the idea here is what you get for this is not just kind of intensive guidance on efficient drug development. You also get kind of the commitment that FDA wants to help see this thing through. And we will do what we need to uh, to try to expedite that review. To the extent this has been successful, actually, we've actually uh, been victims of our own success, sometimes actually getting to approvals before people could actually manufacture the product. So um, uh, we are increasingly uh, uh, working together with manufacturers to make sure that everything is taken into account. 
And finally, uh, although this is not an expedited program, it's something I, I, I shouldn't neglect to tell you about because orphan designation and orphan exclusivity has been in place for quite a number of years. Orphan, the, the whole point of the orphan drug law was to make sure that relatively small populations of people didn't get left behind uh, in drug development. Now at the time, this is a little bit of historical, at the time drug manufacturers were not all that interested in small populations. Since this act was passed, many drug manufacturers have realized it's all about um, our, uh, small populations. It's just if you have a small population and you have a very effective product, uh, there is obviously a, a market to be had. But this orphan product designation allows manufacturers to recoup costs of development. And if they actually get exclusivity um, uh, because they fill a unique need, uh, they actually have seven years in which they essentially block others from the market in that, uh, in that indication. So it's potentially a very useful thing for manufacturers. So this whole group of things that I've told you about, the expedited programs and orphan uh, designation, is what FDA uh, has in its hand to try to help move things uh, forward. Now, it's a little bit dry to talk about it in this way, and so I, what I want to try to do now uh, in about the next 20 minutes is talk to you about developing a, a novel therapy, taking a laboratory discovery through development into a marketed product, and I'm going to have to give you the disclaimer, this is a fictional product, okay? It's a fictional product, it's for instructional purposes only, it, it, it may resemble other products, but it's purely incidental. I don't want to end up at Danbury, okay? <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, it's, uh, there's a nice federal facility there, but I don't want to be uh, in it. Um, Actually, so. you can probably go to Devon's. <laughs> That's right. It's more Thank modern. You. More modern. Thank you. Um, so. Here's a hypothetical lab discovery that, you know, and it's going to come from my area of, of, of the world because at least I can, I can not make a total fool of myself as if I would if this were something in lung cancer. But so you have a discovery where you do expressing, expression profiling in your lab and you find that in acute myeloid leukemia there's a protein that's highly expressed um, in individuals with complex cytogenetic abnormalities. You name it the MUG1 protein for messed up genome 1. Um, you raise an antibody to it, um, and you find out that it's highly expressed on the uh, leukemia cell surface. And when you do the usual workup, you see it's really not expressed uh, very much any place else, much any place else except weakly in adult uh, ovary and testes. Yeah, can, okay. Ah, thank you. Um, okay. So the therapeutic uh, concept is that y you have is that, you know, given that people with complex cytogenetic abnormalities have a poor outcome or relatively poor outcome, even sometimes after allogeneic st stem cell transplant, they don't do quite as well um, uh, after allogeneic stem cell transplant. You figure out, well, maybe when you're taking out the uh, T cells as part of your uh, hematopoietic stem cell harvest, you'll take a portion of the T cells and manipulate them in vitro, putting in a chimeric antigen receptor, uh, targeting this cell surface uh, ant uh, antigen, and then you'll give that back after hematologic recovery and try to wipe out residual disease. So that's a therapeutic concept. It's not totally crazy. You come up with a product candidate, and this is uh, the type of uh, things. This, this, this is actually the, a, a real type of construct with a, it's being used in probably about uh, 30 or 40 studies uh, at least that are ongoing um, uh, uh, that are published in the literature um, where you have uh, a, this kind of single chain uh, antibody here, uh, variable port region, uh, some type of spacer and then uh, a different co-stimulatory uh, domains hooked up to a, a T cell receptor and that's expressed in the cells through some type of retroviral vector um, you decide you're going to put this into uh, T cells, transduce, t you transduce human T cells, and you show that you can get good expression of this construct. So at this point you realize, well, you know, you can't get anyone interested from, an, uh, from an, an industrial perspective. It's a very early stage, so you decide you're going to try to get information from the FDA on this. And so you request an informational meeting with FDA. Uh, regarding how you're going to go about submitting an investigational new drug application. 
um, and you want to understand the process more and you have questions about what studies would need to be done. Um, and so th this is actually something that we do. This thing, this, this informational meeting that doesn't really go down on the record, doesn't count against you. It's kind of just an informal discussion, unlike uh, other discussions that are more formalized. It's called, sometimes called a pre-pre-IND meeting. <laughs> um, basically, we'll sit down and try to answer questions uh, that have to do with uh, how you'd like to develop your product or questions you might have about how you'd go about it. And you have a meeting, and at, at that meeting, you'll, you have a dialogue, and, and FDA might suggest some, uh, some, uh, some, some experiments or some things you might want to engineer into uh, your product. In this case, for this product, they said, hey, you know, you might want to put something like a suicide gene in there just in case the patients develop horrible graft-versus-host disease, something like this. And they connect you up with the office at FDA, which in this case is the Office of Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies that actually handles this area. And you'll have a dialogue that can be ongoing with questions over the course of development. Um, and they'll show you the guidances, uh, in this case a, a completed guidance. This actually is a draft guidance, one that you could actually comment on if you didn't like. Um, uh, and they'll point you to those for things that you might do to help in your development. So you get that information and you move along and you do experiments with your construct and with primary human T cells in an immunodeficient mouse model of uh, primary AML uh, with complex cytogenetics. Um, that, those, those experiments go well. You also uh, develop a proposed manufacturing process um, for the cells. You get Dr. Snyder and he says he's going to give you a good manufacturing practices facility uh, to let you make uh, to make these, uh, uh, make these cells, um, uh, and so you're in, uh, in good shape here. And now you've assembled all this data, um, and, and you draft a kind of a protocol concept of what you think the protocol might look like, and now you actually submit the first real regulatory uh, interaction, which is a pre-IND meeting request. This is actually saying, I'm serious enough about this that I want some real attention from FDA. You're always getting real attention, but now you want formal attention um, from, from FDA. Um, and a meeting package is submitted and questions. Usually the way FDA likes to work is we like to actually, you don't just, if you, if you submit a package to us and say, here's our stuff without any questions, we don't know what to do with it. So it really helps um, if you ask reasonable questions, you know, things like, is the vector, you know, sufficiently safe for use, um, given that we've put a suicide uh, uh, gene in it, things like this. Um, uh, and if you submit this meeting package, you get it into us about four weeks in advance of a meeting, which is usually scheduled. These types of meetings actually take about two months to schedule. Um, but you get the meeting package to us, and in, this, in many cases, when you ask, actually ask good questions, we might not even need a meeting because we'll take the time, review the packages internally, and we'll give you a written response. And anytime you can get something from the government in writing, try to do it. It's always good. It's good, good. You, get it, you get it in writing, um, uh, which is very helpful because it, later on, if somebody at an FDA meeting says, well, we didn't say that, you can always point to their... Uh, uh, to what they've, what they've handed you. Um, and then you get back the responses and you look at them and you think, okay, we can do some of these things. And you do some additional scientific work. You address any FDA issues and then you uh, get a complete phase one protocol together. You've probably submitted it to your IRB at the same time. And you submit an IND package. Now an IND package is quite interesting according to the regulations because basically you submit it to FDA, and if you haven't heard from us in 30 days, you're good to go. Now, in practice, these days, FDA will always call you as soon as we receive it, or we'll give you some type of notice um, by mail that we've received it, because we don't want to be caught off guard. We don't want you to be caught off guard. Um, but technically, if you haven't heard from us within 30 days, you're good to go. Um, uh, the alternative usually is you get a phone call near day 30 where the, the FDA will say, guys, sorry, you're on clinical hold, um, which means they, the FDA has some reason that they're concerned. And at this point, the reason why you could get placed on clinical hold would have to do with either a trivial reason like an administrative one, which is you haven't submitted some key piece of information, or it's about safety. 
um, there is a concern about safety. So there are the, the regulations have uh, one of the two of these things. And I can keep that in mind because we're going to talk, as we come to talk about phase three trials, there's an additional reason why you could be put on clinical hold. So you go ahead, you have a phase one, two design. Uh, in this case, you decide you're going to be very vanilla. You, not understanding what a Bayesian analysis is, you decide you're going to just use a three plus three design and enroll four cohorts of three individuals each. Um, uh, you administer things kind of going up by an order of magnitude each time with each uh, cell dose. And once you get to a, the maximum tolerated dose, uh, you're going to enroll an additional 25 patients and look for some uh, primary and secondary endpoints, which will include relapse-free survival and biomarkers for minimal residual disease. Again, the agency will probably say that seems, seems reasonable, pretty typical cancer type study design. And the statisticians will look it over as well. So what happens, this is easy for me because I made these data up, but in, in, uh, in, in the end you will have done a bunch of, uh, with sweat equity, you will have gotten phase one, two results. And your results hypothetically perhaps show that it's a well-tolerated therapy. It has some adverse effects, um, fever and fatigue, which seem out of proportion, uh, although you don't have a comparative group. You can show using a, a diagnostic, uh, an RT-PCR assay, that indeed people who have detectable MUG1 after they've been transplanted when given this therapy actually have it disappear or start to disappear over time. And when you take this into phase two, you can show that there seems to be improved relapse-free survival and it's better than historical controls at your uh, institution. So that's actually all promising. Now you're actually stuck at a, at a, at a, at a place if you're an academic in, uh, investigator because the development up to here is cost perhaps a few million dollars, could be done with grants, et cetera. Taking it from here to the next stage, uh, a phase three trial is a pretty big leap. The other piece though that's in your favor is right now you have a promising therapy and there are a fair number of biotech companies and pharma companies that might be interested in this. And of course, you have a good technology transfer officer. <laughs> and the technology transfer officer says, wow, you know, this is sounding good here. Let's go shop around with any one of a variety of large pharmaceutical companies or small pharmaceutical companies. And so you have a business development. And this is pretty typical. Um, at this point, uh, a, a, a company will come in and they will do due diligence. And for those of you who are investigators who go through this, they will get into your business. A good company, when they do due diligence for your, uh, for your discovery, the fact that they're questioning you is not that they really don't believe you. It's that they have actually a responsibility. It's actually a responsibility to investors. It actually goes to a different arm of the federal government, um, uh, SEC and FTC. Um, uh, <laughs> that they have to do a good job making sure that this is real, that the data are valid. And they will then, after it's vetted, they will uh, work with the technology uh, transfer officer at your in at university, and there'll be an arrangement uh, and licensing agreement. And you might stay very heavily involved in this, um, but the company then is going to assume further manufacturing and regulatory interactions, um, which is, and, and as well as the clinical development end, which is going to get expensive now. And we'll talk about that at the very end. So very quickly, the company says, look, we want to get a tax break for the development of this. Let's get that in. We, they get in AML with complex cytogenetics. It's, let's look on my, our fingers. It's less than 200,000 people in the United States each year. Um, there's no current therapy in the post-transplant setting for keeping uh, remission uh, in place. They submit an application, and they'll receive it. The bar for orphan designation. Um, is not super high. It does not require an incredible amount of data. The data that I've just showed to you uh, would generally suffice. But in addition, believing the uh, data represent a substantial improvement on a clinically significant endpoint um, over available therapies, which really in this case is we don't do a whole lot after uh, transplant, um, they submit a breakthrough designation request. and. It's reviewed, and it would be granted probably in this case. Again, there's a medical need here, um, uh, and it's a novel therapy. Um, and following that, there'll be a number of discussions. And actually, just to uh, give you an example of the kind of discussions that might happen, in this particular case, there might be a lot of discussion about, can you manufacture this stuff on a large scale? 
Yep. Here, one question. Don't they, why would they want to go for orphan? Doesn't that limit the amount of time that they would have exclusivity? It's, it, 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 it would, yeah, so, so the question is, it, it, that would be a really good question. It depends on who buys this. A small farmer might want to because they get the tax break on their development costs, which could mean a lot of money for them. A larger farmer might say, uh, it, and it also depends on when the patents are. So it all depends on, you're absolutely right. So they might choose not to. I'm, I, I, I took this the small farmer route, but you're, you're, you're spot on, Tom, that, they, that's, uh, that that would be a business decision that they might decide they don't want to do that. You're, 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 you're absolutely correct. Um, so uh, the, uh, you have an issue, the, the discussions about manufacturing are important ones. In addition, um, the FDA might point you to say, look, you know, you have a, you're going to need to have a good co-diagnostic co co for this, uh, a molecular diagnostic that helps you ensure that you can track things as this moves along. And they'll ask you perhaps to meet with the Center for Devices because they want you to be able to have that ready to go at the same time uh, that this product is ready. That actually has become increasingly uh, important. I think Tom knows this from uh, some of his work with ALK. Uh, Mario knows it from uh, BRAF. This has become really increasingly important. And in addition, um, the FDA will start to talk about what they'll want for stratification and endpoints in the next clinical trial. Um, we'll also have to deal with something that is uh, uh, something added to the Christmas tree by Congress um, we'll have to come up with a pediatric development plan. FDA has to make sure that each sponsor has a pediatric development plan or has been granted a deferral um, uh, to pediatric development. In this case, since it's AML with complex cytogenetics and there are so few patients in that group, in the pediatric group, you're able to get a deferral. You might have to come back to it at some point, but at least for the purposes of getting through to uh, submission of a biologics license application, uh, you don't have to worry about it. And then you come to phase three. And phase three is really a monumental change in a development plan because it's monumentally different at the FDA perspective and the sponsor perspective. From the FDA perspective, it's when we have to look at a trial and say, not only is all the administrative stuff correct, not only is it safe, but will it have a reasonable chance of achieving its intended endpoint? It's one of the few times that we can put something on clinical hold for a non-safety issue. So if you have what would be a frivolous clinical trial, it, is not, it, it's, it, it clearly isn't going to answer the question at hand. The trial could be put on clinical hold. Now, in practice, does that happen very often? No, um, but it occasionally does. From the sponsor's perspective, the company, be it a small company, uh, as I've assumed here, or even a large company, when you go into phase three development, the magnitude of how much you're going to be spending increases by one to two orders. So up until now, you, when you make this uh, change, it generally increases one to two orders of magnitude. There are exceptions. There are occasional therapies which, because of their phase two development, look so stellar that they make it through there. But if you have to go into phase three, um, a comparative trial, things get expensive. Um, and at that point, if you're, a smart, uh, if you're a smart sponsor, um, and if we do our job correctly, um, we try to learn from history um, at, 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 at FDA. And we, when we help you come up with your endpoints, we, we help you develop them so that you can get an accelerated approval and that you can then also run a confirmatory clinical trial. One of the things we've learned with targeted therapies that's become a real big problem is that as people progress, they often cross over to the active therapy. Um, and that can actually be uh, a problem. It can make it difficult to actually de determine that you've had an overall survival benefit. Things like that can be uh, issues. So we try to go very thoughtfully in, in working with sponsors to developing phase three endpoints. So what happens then? You have a sponsor FDA interaction. You have a phase three uh, trial, which is successful. It meets its primary endpoint. Um, and you have a biologics license uh, uh, in a, uh, application submission meeting. That's where we basically talk about what's going to come in. Uh, used to come in on trucks, now it comes on CD-ROMs or comes directly in through our gateway, um, which is a direct uh, uh, link into our uh, computer systems that's secure. Um, and you agree on these various uh, nature of things. Uh, and 
we accept the submission as you have your manufacturing ready and then as you have your clinical stuff ready. Um, the, su the submission, because it's obviously part of Breakthrough, gets priority review status. There's a lot of interactive exchange. Um, FDA actually, as they're reviewing in this case, I'm just throwing this in hypothetically because it can happen. Um, and this actually is not that infrequently it, ha infrequently it happens. They say, well, wait a second, you allowed some people at Yale to be treated um, who weren't, they didn't really meet the protocol criteria. They had active disease. Um, and you know, it's fine, you did it with IRB approval, but you know, they had bad outcomes. We can't just ignore them. How are we gonna take them uh, into effect? You might wanna give a, 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 into account, you might wanna give that some thought. Well, if you don't give it some thought, um, FDA will help you uh, to give it some thought because this goes to an advisory committee meeting. Um, and advisory committee meetings are used typically for novel products. Um, not every product that's new has to go before an advisory committee meeting, but in general, things that are novel, um, novel mechanisms of action, um, novel cellular-based therapies will go to an advisory committee meeting. This is a, a committee of people that are very well vetted for conflicts of interest, which means there are only very few people in the United States who are experts who can actually participate in these. And uh, Tom can probably tell you that it's, it's, uh, it's quite, it's quite interest, interesting how, uh, how difficult it can get to be on an advisory committee. But um, th these are put together. And at a presentation, typically, the, the company will you'll go over all the data the background, and FDA will go uh, through its take on this. And they're actually, in many cases, not, the, the, you, it's not quite adversarial like you might think. It's not like a courtroom drama. It's actually, it's actually a relatively collegial uh, dialogue, really trying to get at the places that require further attention. And in this case, I've set up this hypothetical example. So the advisory committee says, hey, you know, this looks like a great product, but you know, the one thing that concerns us is what about that crackpot Dr. Marx who's going to decide to use this in people uh, who have active leukemia and is going to give them terrible side effects. Um, so they mention that oftentimes the advisory committee won't have an answer for that. They leave it for FDA to go back and <laughs> scratch our heads about. Um, and so we do that. Um, in this case, we uh, agree upon, we, we go back after the advisory committee meeting we come upon uh, the nature of the uh, confirmatory trials that'll be needed. You know, basically, in this case, sometimes we just say, look, keep running your trials longer and we'll accept survival data or conduct open label trials um, in, uh, where you use some uh, control cohort. That's obviously very challenging in transplant. have to be very careful with this, but that's why sometimes we'll do multiple things. And ultimately, an approval letter is issued. That usually sends a lot of champagne popping at companies, um, uh, investors running to uh, stockbrokers, et cetera, Martha Stewart going to jail if it's a negative. Uh, uh, okay, oops. Um, so, and this is what you get at the end of the day. This is actually how uh, FDA might, after cogitating for a while, decide how to deal with Dr. Marks who's going to misuse it, they'll put what's called a box warning, sometimes called a black box warning, um, that says, hey, you know, if you use this in people with high leukemia burdens, bad thing. Doctors tend to look here. They forget everything below it, but they do look in the black box because they're worried. Um, and so you have a trade name that you've given this thing, and you have an indication. And below this, you'll have a structured label. Um, and this is, this is what, you know, sponsors are about. So I've taken you through here. Um, FDA has done a fair amount in trying to help get here. Obviously, the sponsor is doing a lot. And just to give you an idea of what the sponsor is doing, let's just talk about the time that this takes and the cost. Um, because it really, is, it really is quite impressive. And I, I'm trying to be somewhat honest here with the uh, time to development. Um, and we can argue about any one of these steps. But these actually are not... Uh, <laughs> Again, the names have been changed to prove uh, to, to, to protect the innocent, and this is not any one product. It's just looking at things and things. Average times thing can, things can take. Um, you can see that that you know early development. This is actually probably optimistic, but you know once you get into trials, phase one two trials don't take a huge long time to complete. But phase three trials are big affairs, um, uh, and. Uh, 
you know, overall here, if you if a nine-year time from discovery to development is pretty good, um, it's not. Uh, there are better. There's some, then there's worse. Average time from discovery to development at FDA, this public statistic, is about 12 years. Um, what's the cost? Well, if you look, the reason why I was talking about why phase three is such a big deal, if you look, to get through to phase one, to the small phase one, two trial, again, this may be a little bit uh, conservative, but uh, I, I've always been a little bit cheap, um, and we do things on the cheap, although you do them correctly. Um, I, you know, you've spent four to perhaps ten million dollars getting through phase uh, two. Once you decide you're going to do a large phase three trial, you're talking about very large amounts of money. And there are a fair number of development programs that have been completed for something on the order of 100 to 200 million dollars. Um, some have been co completed for less than that. Obviously, if you get, um, if you have a product that has uh, a tremendous efficacy um, or requires simple clinical trials. So total cost from discovery to approval, 157 uh, million. That's a figure we can argue about all day, okay? Some would say this is the industry average, 350 to 500 million. And a large pharma company might say that the cost of a new drug is a billion dollars. Why? Because you have to look at all of their development programs and what fails um, and average that in. So the actual cost of a, uh, of a new drug, you can, you can work it from a hundred million to a billion dollars, but this just gives you an idea, at least of the order of magnitude we're talking about. So, what what do companies that succeed generally do uh, correctly? They take time uh, to do things right on the first try. It is amazing the number of problems people get into by trying to do things really quickly um, and not doing them right. I know I, 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 I can tell you from, I can't tell you where, but I can tell you from personal experience in industry that that can happen. And so if you do things right on the first try, you save a lot of the interactive time because if you have to spend six months with FDA fighting over the interpretation of a mouse study that took one month, that's not the greatest thing. Um, Manufacturers that succeed, that succeed have a high degree of product quality through design in their manufacturing process. They take the time to figure this out up front so that they don't have a product that's about to come to a license application where they really can't make it in a way that will be safe uh, or, or have the appropriate controls. They carefully cho uh, choose endpoints and comparators for use in clinical trials, and that can't be stressed enough. The time spent choosing a good endpoint and discussing that with FDA and taking into the account really the input from leaders in the field, um, which is what academics provide, is very important uh, for sponsors because uh, a, a good endpoint uh, can make all the difference in the world. And then finally, keeping a, a, an open line of communication with FDA is really important. Um, I can tell you that from personal experience because when I was on the other side of the fence uh, in industry, we had a, a clinical trial that failed its primary endpoint, which is usually a really bad thing for a phase three trial, bad. Failing phase three endpoint in a, uh, a primary endpoint in a phase three clinical trial, not good. But by communicating with FDA about how it met all its other endpoints and why it failed, um, the drug was salvaged. So this is an important thing and the agency really is here. We, we actually really, it, it's exciting for us to keep in communication um, with scientists. It keeps our reviewers uh, excited about what they're doing. So really what my take home message is, is that you know, we, we do consider innovative technologies as very important at FDA. Getting cancer therapies to patients is very important. Um, we're increasingly doing it in some record time. There have been approvals in the Center for Drugs that have been in four to five months uh, from submission. Um, and uh, we hope to, to, in doing so, we actually uh, you know, make the lives of patients better. So um, I will uh, end there. This was what it should look like in Washington, D.C. today. <laughs> Unfortunately, yesterday we had a blizzard um, with about eight to nine inches of snow. Um, but usually it is, this time last year, that was what cherry blossoms look like. <laughs>
they've got an entire room of people who want to get some guidance on their projects. Howard first. Thanks. I'll talk to you about that later. But <laughs> uh, what I really wanted to ask was uh, if you could address the kind of asymmetry between mm -hmm. drug approvals, be they biologics or other drugs, and non-drugs at the FDA. What we see all the time are their devices, be they predictive tests or, you know, infusion devices, things like that, that are being used without any prospective randomized trials and they're FDA approved. And the public and even the medical community does not really know there's no evidence to support the use of these devices. Yeah, I, 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 it's a very fair question, Howard. The, the, the issue is that I, I didn't go into the law that governs devices, but de many devices can be approved um, uh, on what's called a substantial equivalence to a predicate device, which means basically not on, on a basis of a whole lot of data that gets submitted, or they get, sum they get submitted and approved on the basis of very small data sets. And there is indeed an asymmetry there. Um, FDA is currently in the process of issuing, uh, is, is, is working on this, and will probably issue guidance um, uh, in this area. There have been guidances issued. It, it is, it is there's, no, there's no denying it. There is an asymmetry there uh, between what it takes to get a drug approved and some of the devices that are being used. Well, I, uh, I, what I also think is that you're not really protecting the public that well, and certainly you're not making it known about how little data is necessary to get some of these things approved. Yeah, it, it's really quite interesting because you know what the most vocal lobby is on Capitol Hill um, about, is even more so than our friends at Pharma, it's actually the medical device industry and how we obstruct medical innovation. Part of the reason why that is is that although I, I would tend to agree with you, again, my personal opinion, not that of the FDA or these, the United States government, I would tend to agree with you. Um, they will point to the fact that in Europe, these same devices have even a lower regulatory bar, something called CE marking, where basically, as long as the engineering controls are adhered to, they can market these things. So we have this kind of balance here of dealing with the fact that in Europe, it's really open season, and we try to do what we can. Um, there is an increasing effort in Center for Devices to try to deal with this, but Part of this is the inertia that's developed over the course of years. Um, and there's, just to, to give you an example, part of what they have to deal with is the fact that for some of these devices, there's been what we call a kind of a, a substantial equivalence creep. Something started out as a Band-Aid, but now it's a, a cellular adhesive. So Peter, <coughs> when you were here, one of the things that characterized your clinical care was that you were an unending advocate for your patients, and you would go to the wall to find the most innovative uh, approach to a patient, even if it was not on label and it was a, a real uh, crazy attempt, but you thought it might have a chance of working, okay? How has it been being on the other side now when you've got to look at the safety of a huge population? And as someone who I know is such a passionate doctor, how do you find that within yourself? Yeah, so, so a lot of this boils down to dealing with it's, it's something I've already mentioned, but it's benefit and risk for the individual and the uncertainty that exists. And I, there are single patient use exceptions that come in for therapies where they have a compelling need for a patient where we will tend to look upon them perhaps favorably. Not that you'd want to see that done in a large scale clinical trial. And we will let an invest investigator go and move ahead in a given patient or in a very small group of patients. Um, but ultimately, you do have to, when we think about other products, we do have to think about the broader scale of, of safety um, and the potential benefits in a population versus the potential risks. I think a very good case study um, from the leukemia end is ponitinib and its you know, adverse events. You know, FDA approved the thing in record time. Everyone was very proud. Everyone had celebration. And then about uh, more than a quarter, up to 43% of people had adverse events that it came out. Um, many of them were serious thrombotic events and we actually had to pull the approval for a period and then n now it's been allowed back on again with this benefit to risk and caution. So it, it is a constant balancing act. Um, I don't think we have the right answer always. Um, but we do try to be compassionate to the extent that when we see uh, when we see single patient use 
uh, ex exemptions that come in, we try to make sure we give them good consideration. Yes, Ed. <clears throat> Not to give you too hot a political potato, but how insulated, if at all, is the FDA based on the persuasion in the uh, executive branch of the government uh, that may be more conservative if there's a change in the persuasion in the coming election? Is the agency very vulnerable or somewhat, or how does that work? You know, I, I, would, I, I think I have to be, um, I want to be careful here. Um, but what I would say is there, the things that are most vulnerable are the things that are high profile and that may be um, of, uh, of interest to particular members of Congress or to the executive branch. I would say, unfortunately, women's health issues often end up in that, in that area. Um, we just dealt with one, I can be honest, because it was at a public advisory committee meeting, uh, the issue uh, of uh, embryo manipulation technologies. Big, uh, it gets people really fired up, and it's possible that, that uh, an executive or branch or, or Congress could get excited about that. On the other hand, when it has to do with the day-to-day -day approvals, short of things, again, Plan B, another women's reproductive health issue, um, uh, or certain things like it, um, other things, I, I don't see them meddling a whole lot in cancer therapies um, I, I, or, or many of the other things. So we have a fair amount of areas where um, there's not a lot. And, and there are those, those some that, that the current Congress actually, I think, has shown itself to be quite interested in, for instance, pain, pain medications. And that should be of interest to us in this audience because we care that there are good pain medicines uh, available and there's not a lot of stigma with them. But um, it could change. Um, luckily, um, a fair amount of FDA um, uh, is civil service. Um, and so <laughs> we go about doing our job and try to keep our heads low. Um, and uh, if, if we've done our job well, we're the equivalent of a B-1 bomber. You know, we've done our job well or a B, you know, you know, you know we just, we, uh, B-2 bomber, sorry. We, uh, Peter, are we you going to tell us where that, that Malaysian Airlines plane is? Is that what you're getting to now? <laughs> Dr. Sklar. So uh, I have a question that's a little bit the opposite side of, uh, of Howard's uh, point. Um, uh, in my world of molecular diagnostics, uh, let me try this one. In my world of molecular diagnostics, um, there's been a fair amount of confusion about uh, companion diagnostics and FDA approvals and what the obligations are to use these kinds of things. Of course, the manufacturers tell you you're obligated to use the companion diagnostic. But what are the obligations? Uh, and case in point would be the elk fish test, for instance. Yeah, you know what? That's an area where I really can't say anything on, but I would stay tuned. Um, just stay tuned. Um, he knows where the plane is, guys, just so you know, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry, there, but I, I don't mean to be evasive, but, but there, 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 just so you know, there, when, I, I can tell you this, when something, when there is a regulatory action or regulatory guidance pending, we can't discuss it. Just like, just so you know, people get really mad at the FDA because we don't, we, we can't say, so if, if Dr. Lynch submits the best new cancer therapy, the FDA, and we think it's the best thing since sliced bread. We can't say anything about it. With, he can say something about it, or he can give us permission in writing to say something about it, but that's proprietary information until the drug is approved. We can't even acknowledge that Dr. Lynch submitted something to us, um, and that's commercial confidential information. So it, it makes it very difficult sometimes, and it makes actually, if, if all of the things that have been the hardest for me to get used to is the fact that we have to do that sometimes. But you were never a big gossip, Peter. <laughs> you were always very good with confidentiality. That comes naturally to you. Last question for Dr. Marks. Um, as a doctor uh, who practiced in the 80s and 90s, or late 80s and early 90s, you came to begin your your career, and as a regulator, tell us what you thought of Dallas Buyers Club. <laughs> Honestly. I'm at a loss. You didn't see it? No. Oh, it's all about the FDA. Oh, my god. Well, not really. <laughs> okay. But it's, it's actually a very interesting movie where some of the issues are the approval of unapproved therapies, why AZT took so long to get to market, how the AIDS community responded, how the AIDS activists put additional 
actually revolutionized the approval of some of these drugs. You may want to comment on that about yeah. how that. But that, that I do know. I mean, that, that this 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 is actually democracy in action, which is that FDA is is there, and it there was a lot of incredible amount of patient activism. Um, it actually also had to do that same time. There was a lot of activism on blood safety from hem the hemophilia committee uh, c committees or committee. And of that's 10, part 000. of your purview, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, and you yeah, were able to admit that. I, I can I can admit that I actually work on, on on biologic therapies. I can even I can even say that our center handles you know certain agents that are used for protection against terrorist attacks. So I can say that. Can't say more. Um, we'll never know where the plane is. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, you know, there is it, it, the fact is that that pressure from advocacy groups has been good. And I, actually, and I think it is important. And actually, to be honest, the best thing people can do when they have concerns about things like uh, laboratory developed tests and diagnostics uh, is when we have things that are draft guidance uh, or when we have draft rules to write to the docket. Because Occasionally, I, I know I can say this already myself. You see something in the docket where somebody has actually formulated an issue extremely in a, an extremely compelling manner that we haven't considered before, and it makes a big difference. Um, uh, uh, so we listen for that. Peter, thank you for a fabulous presentation. It was great.